He's co-captain of the Ball Hogs and the Big Three season tips off coming up on Friday in Houston. That's going to be live on FS1 if you want to watch on TV at 6.30 Eastern time. Tickets are available, and the whole circuit comes back. Chicago, Oakland, Dallas, Brooklyn for the championship game later on in the summer. Friday nights are the games, 7.30 until 10.30 Eastern time. FS1's got the games as well. This was a cool year number one for you. How fun is it going into year number two? Well, the thing that's different is there's so many more players, so many guys that were – a little tepid of getting in and, and jumping in with two feet. I think these guys are all in. Nate Robinson, Carlos Boozer, Meta World Peace, Amari Stoudemire. Like, these guys are going to bring this game to a whole new level. I'm really excited about seeing, like, a guy like Nate Robinson who has a huge personality. How is it going to translate onto the floor? But uh, one thing that people have to understand, it's not, like, exhibition. It's not, you know, the N1 mixtape tour. These are highly competitive games, and guys want to win, and, at the end of the day, the team that wins makes the most money. The team that finishes last makes the least amount of money. So I think that, that you know that's obviously going to factor into it. Yeah, the big three is back. It was very cool to see it come through here in New York City last year. And then the gear is really cool, too. I got a Ghost Ballers hat, which I try to rock. The only thing is <laughs> I can't rock the flat brim cap. So I'm like a dad cap yeah, guy because yeah. as a product of the 80s and 90s, I always bend the bend the brim. Baseball style. Yeah. So, so you know there's a new... Which you would look all right, like in in yellow. It's a it's a really yellow yellow white mamba hat a that you ma- that you can rock. I'll send you one now. Okay, a wh- maybe a white mamba I could get down with. And then what you got to do, especially probably you and me feel the same way, right? You can't wear like the brand spanking new hat. Got to kind of with the logo that doesn't work. No, so throw some dirt on it, clean yeah. it, yeah. bend the brim, right. the, the yes. brim, yes, and then you're good to go. Like, but but white mamba hats are coming out. It's gonna be sweet. <laughs> I was so happy when they showed me the picture of the white mamba hat. It was like, these guys are like making me into a star. And I, I, I've never thought I would ever have my own hat. Well, it's such an interesting career that you had. Brian Scalabrini joins us here on the show because you became a fan favorite seemingly overnight. And I mean, it is translated into appearances in Boston. I saw that you were at a Walmart in Worcester yeah. in April. Yeah. And so people are just kind of coming from wherever to meet you and to get an autograph. And the human victory cigar, that whole thing. What an amazing arc for you. Sure. And I think it's probably like, do you have a father? Sure. Sure. So your father would tell you, look at kid. If this guy can do it, you can do it. So I like present all hope for white suburban <laughs> kids out there who really have no hope, you know? And then they walk up to me and they meet me and they look up like, Dude, you're huge. Yeah. I go like, well, what'd you expect, man? I'm an NBA basketball player. Well, I don't know. I just kind of thought you were like some average guy out there. Yeah. Like, nah, nah, I'm an average guy out in the NBA. I'm just not an average guy in the real world. You have an average guy that's about a foot and a half taller than you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that helps. Like, if, you know, if I was two inches shorter, you would not know who I am, <laughs> right? It's like every inch matters. <laughs> This is a fascinating offseason for the Boston Celtics, who you cover throughout the regular season and the playoffs. Do you think Danny Ainge wants a LeBron or a Kawhi, or do you think that only if it fits does he want it? Otherwise, he's totally cool with his roster. So, I think all three, right? Well, I'm not sure he wants LeBron James. I'm not sure that as of right now, there's going to be a little bit of stunting the growth of your young players when you bring a guy like that in. So I think if you look at it from a, from a Celtic standpoint or from what I know about Danny Ainge, and there's nothing he's told me, but just like I think he wants to try to beat LeBron. I think he wants to try to build this team and, and get to the NBA Finals. But I, I think the Kawhi Leonard thing is really interesting because he's not a huge personality, but he's a, unbel- he's a top five player in the NBA. And the Celtics have – uh, you know, a, tre- a treasure trove of assets of, of different things that they can do. They have picks moving forward. They have young guys. They have rookie scale guys, max guys. So with all that being said, can you in- slightly improve your team with a top five player? Yeah. I'm sure if Anthony Davis was available, that'd be another guy that they would look into getting. But outside of that, like, how can you really improve this roster right now? You, I don't know if you can make a small move that's going to help this team, like, sort of get over the hump. Well, and then there's a cost analysis as well. What do you have to give up to get an Anthony Davis, or what do you have to give up? To and Anthony get Davis is not available. A Kawhi Leonard, correct. Yeah, but yeah. I know that that's kind of like part of the the speculation with Celtics fans: who's the big star we can pull in sure. that complements this team or completes the team? 
But what do you have to give up? You know, Gordon Hayward was a free agent. Al Horford's a free agent. How much do you have to give up to get a Kawhi Leonard? Oh, sure. Does I mean, that make sense, do yeah. you think? I don't think that when you think about the young players, I don't think that the Tatums, the Browns, those are the ones that, are the, like, that you want to hold on to the longest, right? Like understanding the salary cap, rookie scale contract. Jason Tatum makes, you know, $6 million. He's right now as good as he is. He's a $20 million player, right? So having guys on rookie scale allow you major flexibility moving forward. Terry Rozier, he played above his contract. So with all these guys that are all under contract, if you're going to give something up, you better know this move that you make is going to put you over the hump. And I still believe, like, when you look at the Warriors, to me, I, you know, I love Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond, but to me, it's Kevin Durant. Like, how do you match up with Kevin Durant? If you want to beat the Warriors, you got to figure out the KD problem first. Because if you don't have anybody and go uh, toe-to-toe with Kevin Durant, I don't think you, you beat the Warriors. Because the other guys are eventually going to take advantage of you, and they're going to have their big games. But it's Durant that you have to be able to match up to. Brian Scalabrini joins us here in studio. Do you respect what Kevin Durant did? Yeah, I have no problem with it. But players can get traded all the time. So why would I have a problem with him making a move so he can cement his legacy where he can win five championships if everything, if the cards play themselves out right? You look at it the same as if he won a championship in Oklahoma City? No. But I don't think in, in hindsight, I don't think it matters. Like, I don't think when LeBron went to Miami and wins or goes back to Cleveland, like, he made it like I'm going back to Cleveland because I want to, like, help the economy of Northeast Ohio. He didn't look at it like we have Kyrie Irving and I just got the number one pick, which I can trade for another all-star in Kevin Love. LeBron's only mistake, in my opinion, when he went back was he did not see the Warriors coming. He, he thought he had to beat the Spurs, who just roasted him in the NBA Finals. And by the way, Kevin Love had like a 40-20 and 20 game against San Antonio and beat him in San Antonio. So he's like, no, this is the guy I need. But his mistake was that. He should have thought, how do I beat the Warriors? And if he would have geared the team towards that, maybe that Wiggins trade looks a lot different. But he couldn't have known the Warriors were going to become the Warriors. Well, he's, he's a basketball brilliant. Oh, my mind. I'm so smart. Oh, come on. I remember everything, oh. you know? How do you not see you, it? So you're clowning LeBron right no. now. Oh, I, I'm not. Oh, I didn't sign the. Uh, did you sign the, the non compete? Non disclosure. Yeah, yeah, that you can't talk about LeBron. <laughs> like, I can respect LeBron as a brilliant player, but I mean, come so on. The, the hold- soft cast. I mean, like, he does a lot of goofy stuff. He's not telling the Cavs whether he's coming back or not when they're heading into the draft with the eight pick. Come on. This plays well in Boston, that take. It doesn't play well in New York? I think people outside of Boston generally, I think generally respect LeBron. We and- do too. I don't know about no, that. No, no, I respect LeBron as the second greatest player of all time, and that's not a knock. No, I would that's say. That's like, to, you're the second greatest player, there's some course, pretty good absolutely, players. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, I'm putting you above Larry, Magic, like, Wilt. I'm putting you above all those guys. But, absolutely. But, like, okay, the soft cast, that's odd. Uh, you mean in the finals? Yeah. So you don't believe that he was actually injured? Well, he had a broken hand? Well, it could have been a deep bruise, right? You- he said broken hand, pretty much had a broken hand. So you don't believe that he was injured at all? Well, no, I'm saying, well, everybody's injured during the NBA Finals. Okay, so do you believe that he punched a whiteboard? Sure. Okay, you just don't think it was really injured? Well, he was doing push-ups before game two. He was dapping up <laughs> with his kid after game four. I mean, I mean, I get it. Look, and I don't have, like, I don't have a problem with it. I just... Is he an and, excuse maker? No, no, I'm just saying that the media, you guys let him off the hook a little too, too, too much. And we let him off the hook. You guys let him off the hook. So... When LeBron, comes- like, why? Like, LeBron, but- you got the cast on. What's happened? But why not this question? LeBron, you didn't really try in the second half of game four. What happened? Okay, so that's fair. But knowing that the Warriors were going to turn to the Warriors is ridiculous because they had made the playoffs, I think, the year before, but they were no- nowhere close to being a championship caliber team because they had Mark Jackson, not Steve Kerr. Sure. So LeBron going to Cleveland can't think no, no, no. that it's- team's going to be awesome and then get Kevin Durant in two years. Oh, man, he definitely should be listening to me on Fox Sports 1 when I was on that. <laughs> I was like, the, the team, the next team is the Warriors. And by the way, Steph Curry's the MVP of the league if he can figure out his passing situation. <laughs> But, you know, maybe LeBron doesn't listen to me. But his camp and his his camp, they're so smart. And LeBron, he's so smart. Well, if you're so smart, why didn't you see the Warriors coming? Anyways, it doesn't matter. He's, I, I, no, LeBron is, is hijacking my big three interview here. So, well, we're going to get to more on the big three coming up here. But so you think what, that what LeBron is doing now, is it just setting everything up to go to L.A.? Well, it's, to me, it's just messed up that he's not communicating with the Cavs. Like, if you're LeBron and you're in with the Cavs, you're saying, hey, I really like this player. I really, I, I, here's what I want to do. If, if, can we 
can we trade the eighth pick and this so and so to go and get some so? But when a trade doesn't work out, like somehow, some way, LeBron has no idea it went down. Like LeBron was blindsided by the Kyrie <laughs> Irving trade. But but if you have like like documentation of him saying, so he had no idea Kyrie was going to get traded. But of, like in 2004, he knew that I really liked Iguodala, but we took Luke Jackson instead. Like he was involved in those conversations. I really want an Iguodala, but he had no idea Kyrie is going to get traded. But like right now, you got to be communicating. If you are all in on the Cleveland Cavaliers, then you're you're, you're like, what can we do with this eight well, pick? He ain't all in. Yeah, exactly. That's why he's, he's, he's out. He's going to L.A. You think he's going to L.A.? I mean, where else? I think he is too. Unless he opts into his deal and gets traded to Houston, that would be the only other scenario. But I guess he's not too. You're saying no on Philly. Yeah, I think this whole thing was it was so bizarre. The whole Philly thing, and, I think, and no on San Antonio. And there's no cap space. It's like that's they'd an odd to, thing. They'd have to move a lot. Yeah, the Cavs have to agree to take on some of these bad contracts. Right. You know. Yeah. The Houston one's interesting because you can trade a future first, two future firsts for Ryan Anderson and for LeBron. 